Well, it, well, it's the top of the hour, and it's uh, time to start our uh, monthly webinar. Again, uh, good day, everyone. My name is David Failing. I'm with uh, Lucas Diesel Systems. I'm the new business development director. And on behalf of Lucas Diesel Systems, I'd like to welcome everyone uh, today to this, um, I think this is the 11th uh, webinar of, uh, of this year. So progressing, uh, we'll have another one uh, in December. And then for everyone's information, we will have uh, another uh, set of webinars uh, next year. So uh, Tony will continue with us for uh, another year, which is great news for everyone. Um, for, for informational purposes, uh, this, this uh, webinar is being recorded, and then it will be available in a, a day or so on our Lucas Diesel YouTube channel. In addition, Tony uh, places it on his uh, website. So if you miss a portion of it or you want to share this webinar with someone else or look at it in the future, it will be available in at least two locations. Uh, the other item I wanted to uh, housekeeping item is uh, that everyone is muted at the present time. But if you have any questions, uh, please place them in the Q&A uh, section here at the bottom of your screen. And uh, at the end of the webinar, we will get to it and we'll answer as many questions as we can. Uh, one other last item, uh, next Tuesday, Tuesday being the 5th of December, at this same time, uh, we will be having another webinar, not with Tony, but with a, uh, a, a new individual. And uh, I will be making uh, some, some pretty important uh, announcements at that point in time. So I'm not letting the cat out of the bag, as they say today, but uh, please stay tuned uh, next uh, Tuesday at the same time that you look, uh, that you register today. And uh, we will have another one hour webinar uh, together with a, a couple of major announcements from Lucas. So without further ado, uh, our presenter today is Tony Salas. Tony has a uh, business in uh, Las Vegas. He also is an instructor for uh, his company in Las Vegas. And he has many years of uh, tremendously good experience, good hands-on experience. So the title to Tony's presentation uh, today is Light Duty Diesel Electrical Diagnostics and Review. So without further ado, Tony, it's all yours. Thank you, Mr. David. Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to uh, November, end of November, last day of November. Uh, Going to be, hopefully you all had a great holiday, by the way. Uh, Thanksgiving, Christmas coming up, so this is a nice time of year, but it doesn't mean that there isn't time to learn. So therefore, we have a lot going on, a lot happening. Uh, definitely, hopefully you can all, uh, you know, appreciate the fact that we are still being sponsored by uh, Lucas. So once again, if I haven't thanked Lucas, first of all, let me say that. Thank you for sponsoring these free webinars for you guys, and in this case, to help you out with some information. Um, and many times when I develop these webinars, you know, I don't want to sound like I'm repeating myself. But one thing I've learned when I was going through my post-secondary training to learn how to teach is the fact that, you know, repetition is very important. And in this case, we repeat things, repeat things, don't be remember. So when I come up with these conclusions of, OK, what should I cover this week? I'm basing it a lot on A, the emails I get, B, the phone calls I get. And I've been bad about phone calls lately because I've been so pretty much uh, overwhelmed with a lot I got going on right now. So therefore, um, you know, we need to have a sense of pride of how we address things. And what I mean by that is, you know, I want to know things, how they work. And right now we're in an evolution of changing over, not changing over, but adjusting to other technology. For example, we have diesel out there, obviously. And with diesel, there are fleets that run propane, natural gas, and now hydrogen is playing out in California and other states, I hear which don't ask me anything about that. I have no idea about hydrogen, what's going on, but it is happening. It is on the road. And then it comes EV, you know, electrical vehicles. But no matter how you cut it, whether whatever application of fuel that you're using, it all comes down to electrical electronic controls. So therefore, one of fight that we continue to have, and some of you may have heard this already, is the fact that, you know, where are you with electrical? So when we are working with another instructor right now with EV, it's like the fact that we understand what's going on electrical. So recently I was at a conference. And in this case, that conference, I was talking to technicians, uh, excuse me, not technician instructors. 
And I said, let me ask you guys a question. I go, the question I got is, you're all about teaching all this new EV technology and, you know, everything about the controls and how it all works. But in reality, you know, where is the level of technician you're training on the electrical side? Because from my point of view, you know, I'm, it's very seldom, you know, I come to shops, I go to shops. You guys know that I visit shops and stuff and I go teach at shops. And the thing is, you know, where are you on electrical? And some of them are very good. They've gone through some post-secondary training. But in this case, there's been some that are just very weak. So as we talk about what is involved with diagnosis, we've been talking about this. We're now living in a heavy world of programming and reprogramming. We see new tools coming out. For example, if you're working on a Ford product with a 6.7 power stroke, you know, some BCMs on some of these early 2011, 2012 trucks are hard to come by. And now there's uh, tools out there that actually have you take a used one and reprogram the VIN. So therefore, we're doing that. But some, you know, phone calls that I get or some trucks that I've seen here, you know, I got a blinker that doesn't blink. And who's in charge of the blinkers? You know, in other words, your signals. And in this case, you got a body control function there. So, you know, we live in that kind of world nowadays. So before you are going to be spending extensive money on a module, that might be the problem. You got to make sure that you got good powers and ground. So I'm going to start from some of the basics to some of the more advanced. But then we got drive cycles. Hey, I get it. You know, we're dealing with emission control stuff, too, as well. And there are mechanical issues. And that's another story. That's actually a future webinar. Talk about mechanical issues, because sometimes we focus so much on common rail turbocharging intakes. But we tend to forget that there's pistons and valves there, you know. In other words, can balancing rates on a Duramax be affected by excessive valve lash? And the answer is yes, you know, but, you know, we got the after treatment. We've been talking about that in previous webinars and other training. We have fueling. We have cooling issues. I mean, a whole array of different things that can happen. So therefore, you know, we got to be equipped with the proper tools. So where do you start? What is your routine? What to perform? You know, and we've been saying about, you know, as much as we can talk about all this nice technical information again, We've been talking about that strategy of what you're always going to do. And I make it an effort to do that. And I still get the phone calls. I still get the issues where guys will tell me, you know, I did this. I go, whoa, 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 backtrack. Did you test the basics? Did you look at these basics? They're like, no, I was going to do that later. I'm like, no, it's got to stick to it. So therefore, your skills need to be electrical, obviously, and mechanical knowledge of subsystems found in the light duty diesel application. So you don't want to find yourself wasting diagnostic time and frustrated and those of you that are really bad are the ones that see a code let's say it's for a mass airflow sensor and you replace the mass airflow sensor still that code is there right so therefore you then you start oh crap what do i do now i got to diagnose and so on right so when it comes to tooling one of my favorite tools is obviously my my diagnostic my excuse me my meter so in this case my meter is very important to me uh this meter actually i'm holding my hand i need to fix it but uh in this case you know that's probably been with me over 20 some years and in this case i have used it time and time again for diagnostic for voltage drone resistors so let's start off from there in your meter you know how many of you have using the most capacity of your meter in other words do you know your meter very well you probably have measured volts amps you know and so on resistance most likely in testing circuits too as well but then it has other features you know the features are like min max mode you also got the ability to measure amperage in a circuit but no more than 10 amps but you can put adapters on there which are inductive adapters you can put on a meter i guess what I'm trying to get at obviously this is not a meter class is do you understand all the functions of a meter you know for example this test capacitance too as well and diode check too as well you can test diodes and again, it can measure AC and DC. But again, this is just a CAT3 up to 1,000 volts max, according to what we see here. Now, we're going to talk about later on in the future with electrical about CAT functions that you'll find. In other words, the CAT designation for the maximum voltage you can measure. But that's another story. And then when you're measuring resistance of an injector, right? You, let's say the one classic one I've always been using in my class is the 5.9 injector. You know, greater than zero, less than one ohm of resistance supposed to have, right? So in this case, you know, are you zeroing the meter? So therefore, you need to make sure that's all calibrated. You know, I work with my Zeus. Uh, that's my go-to tool for everything when I go, especially when I go to shops and so on. And in this case, you know, you got to zero that meter to make sure there is no unwanted resistance in the lines or in the leads of your meter itself. So therefore, there's those, those basics when you're doing electrical checks as well. So in this case, you know, you got to always remember them. 
and the, why it's important to understand this is that, you know, what is not controlled or monitored by a co modular computer? You know, you look at a NOx sensor, for example, we've been hitting hard and heavy, and that's going to be a future class. We're going to hit hard and heavy on NOx sensors. You do have battery power, you have ground, and then you got your CAN wires right there, your high and low. And in this case, you know, most modules have a, excuse me, most NOx sensors have a module attached to it, right? And in this case, how do you diagnose that NOx sensor when it comes to electrical? Well, all you can do is look at the battery, power, you can look at ground, and then you can also look at your CAN communication, but how do you diagnose and look at CAN? Now we have done a network presentation here before with um, Lucas, so you're welcome to look at that on their YouTube page and take a view of that, but then we're gonna take it a step forward. And in this case, we got to look at, we understand how we look at that. And everybody and everybody right now is doing network classes. I see so many advertised in different places about CAN communication and diagnosis. Well, it isn't as easy. So when somebody says it's easy, I'm going to call, I want to say a bad word, but in other words, I want to call that not necessarily because some of them can be very hard. You know, I've watched Audi techs. I watch BMW techs. I watch different presentations of people talking about this. And one thing I have found out when it comes to intermittent issues with CAN communication or just a part of a local network shutdown has been that a module itself is doing it. Some of you might agree or disagree. And if you have a comment on that, please hit it on the chat. But in this case, we have seen cases where the module itself is the culprit internally. And in many cases, the only way to know is to literally unplug it from it. So when I see these teachers talking about, and I'm not, I don't like to put my competition or anybody down, but when I see them talk about, you know, scoping and this and that, you're right. But the thing is, you could have a connection problem. You can have a grounding problem, a short to power problem, whatever has happened to the vehicle itself. And in this case, you know, the bottom line is sometimes the module itself is causing that <laughs> intermittent problem or intermittent U code you can get. So obviously, you know, how would you diagnose this, you know? So in many cases, you know, it does do self-diagnostics, this knock sensor module, and it checks for things such as opens, grounds, and shorts. It does all that, right? So, but networks have evolved, and we use local networks where you can have communication, you know, take place within one central module and splits off to one direction. So the way I like to view it, and I'll be showing that in future training, is that I like to look at the wiring diagrams, schematics, and see who is in what local network to see who shares a common denominator, why I have these set of U-codes or intermittent problems. You know, we see people on different other vehicles, and we've seen it on trucks too as well, where you turn a key on and there's no start, no crank. In other words, you got a key on and all the lights are just flashing once you, if it does turn on. I mean, the problems could be very erratic and they could be often, you know, overlooked on the basics too as well. But just understand that, you know, corrosion is a bad thing. For example, when a vehicle's been underwater, like those flooded trucks or those flooded cars, those can actually cause a lot of intermittent issues too as well. So it's no fun to diagnose. And by the way, this all takes time. You know, definitely takes a lot of time what you're going to do and how you're going to diagnose it. So like I've said before, you know, <clears throat> I've been getting quite a few of 7.3s three, uh, around here. It's been a 7.3 heavy year. And in this case, you know, you look at a 7.3 and you understand how a 7.3 works. I know it's old technology, but geez, if you don't have a, a grasp on the electricals on 7.3, and believe it or not, the customer that came to me, I told him, we're going to spend the latter half of December on this truck. He Fortunately, he has other trucks, but this truck has been literally to hell and back. And what I mean by that is, I think it's still in hell, because of the fact that the truck went in for some simple diagnosis, and next thing you know, it went to three shops. This guy literally has had it in shops for over a year and a half. It's been sitting at different shops. Finally, he comes to me, and the latest and greatest has been that they actually bought, he bought another truck from a junkyard and literally took all the wine harness and they put it on his truck that did not have that issues. You know, in other words, it got to the point they say, "Oh, it's definitely, you got to short the ground." And when you look at a 7.3, the wiring harness of a 7.3 is not too complicated. Those of you that work on 7.3s know about the valve cover gasket issues to the glow plugs and the injectors and that connector going there. You know, but in this case, it's all pretty easy to me, you know, and I guess because I played a lot with it. But don't get me wrong. I've had a 7.3s, you know, make me humble, too, with bad ECMs, PCMs. But in this case, 
you know, we look at this wiring diagram that Ford gives and and I love this old Ford diagrams because of the fact that they give you a lot of notes there, you know. There you could see the two relays right here. You got your PCM power relay and you got your IDM power relay and then you got your IPR right there. And some of you have known the trick about how to deadhead a system by providing battery power and ground to the IPR. Shut it, completely crank it to get rid of all the air. Some of you guys might know that trick. But regardless, though, you're going to notice here you actually have a lot of notes. So I've, unfortunately, Ford has done changes to their wiring diagrams, but I wish they would have some of these notes. For example, you know, take a look right here on the PCM power relay right here. And it says directs voltage current to PCM and PCM related components. You know, in this case, we see the IPR right there. As a matter of fact, let me get my laser pointer here for those of you that can't see. There we go. There's our IPR right there, and it tells you it regu regulates high pressure oil used for controlling fuel injectors, and over here it provides power to the IDM. Now, the question that I got is the fact that a very challenging thing that we've been teaching over and over again is relays. You know, like I said, I just did a conference not too long ago, and my whole subject was relays. And these guys, half of them were like, I'm like, really, guys, you've been working in this business for a long time. You still don't understand relays. Can we please learn relays, you know? And in this case, the relay itself. So if it's a 99 model relay, right? It, 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 how many times have those contacts on that PCM power relay and the IDM power relay have been used, you know? And in this case, those are contacts that open and close. It's a mechanical device that opens and closes, right? So it's a switch. So therefore, we have seen so many problems with these trucks when it comes to the IDM or the PCM power relay. So therefore, the question begs, you know, do you have a relay problem? Yesterday at the shop, again, working on a Chevy Silverado gasoline truck, and these guys had a fuel pump problem, and they're going crazy. And the guys are looking at me going, well, how's the relay work? And I'm like, Jesus Christ, these are 20-year-plus veteran mechanics that still don't know how the relay works. Now, I'm not trying to dock anybody down. I'm just trying to say, hey, will you please learn a dang relay? You know, very important. Now, let me switch screens here for a second. I'm going to switch screens here, and I'm going to go over to my service information. And a long time ago, just so you can understand, we, we talk about in electrical classes, you know, we talk about, you know, you know, voltage drop testing. You know, we talk about voltage drop testing. And voltage drop testing means, hey, this component is supposed to work with battery voltage or whatever voltage. Does it have that voltage while it's on? That's where we have the dynamic testing, right? Dynamic testing is test the stuff while it's working. If I'm testing power to a computer or module, I'm going to have the key on and test to see if it's, you know, all got the proper voltage. Now, I'm going to show you a video here in a little bit about that, but let's quickly look here. An infamous code that I still see to the day is PO380 on an LB7 or LLY Duramax, depending how it's set up, mostly LB7s. And in this case, you're going to notice right here um, the glow plug relay, right? And this is a very primitive design. But again, we have guys working on these old trucks that are still dealing with these issues because, again, our not wanting to learn electrical correctly. So we see the coil side of the relay. We see the high current side of the relay, AKA known as the switch side of the relay, right? And this PL380 keeps setting, right? Now, how did the computer know if the glow plug's working? Now here's battery power up here. And then we could see a fusible link being used, right? Again, this is old trucks. I know fusible links are pretty much gone almost. And then when the glow plug relay contacts close, it energizes all eight relays, right? I mean, excuse me, all eight glow plugs, right? But you're going to see a splice right here of another fusible link, and there's your glow plug signal, okay? So if the contacts close, that means we do have a signal going to connector one at cavity 52 right there, okay? That's how the computer knows if the glow plugs are energized. But it doesn't tell you which glow plug is bad, if there is a bad glow plug. That's the difference between a federal truck and a California truck, because a California truck is monitoring them individually on these LB7s. However, what I'm trying to get at is you got an intermittent PL380 code, okay? And PL380 is glow plug performance. And in this case, a lot of guys will test the glow plugs, they'll do the traditional way, and they'll see there's not a problem. But what's happening is the cause of the common PL380, believe it or not, is G108 right there. In other words, that G108 is located at the front of the passenger side of the block, just above the oil pan, you're going to see G108. And in this case, what happens is that you got high resistance on that ground. So therefore, a lot of guys will grab a test light 
if you are testing the ECM side or control side of the relay, you're supposed to put a test light right on that side of the relay to see if you're getting power. The problem is they do it probably with the relay removed. So therefore, what you're supposed to do is actually do a voltage drop test across it. In other words, put your meter leads. And yes, you can stick your leads in there. You got to be creative. Or you can buy the adapters that go into the sock and you put the relay above it. And it has little leads for you to measure voltage drop, not only across the coil side, but also the switch side to see if you got high resistance there on those contacts. So therefore, you're going to do that. Now, a lot of us cheat. I know, I get it, I do it sometimes myself, is that if I got another relay that I'm diagnosing, I'll just swap it, you know, with another relay. But this is a big relay. This is a different kind of relay. But no matter what, you're supposed to do a voltage drop across these. And turns out that I'm, my source voltage at my battery is 13.5, and I have literally 11.2 across these coils. So literally both leads are across the coil contacts. So in turn, the electromagnetic field that closes these contacts is weak, and intermittently we'll be opening and closing that glow plug relay, which will see an open and close signal going to the signal wire going to cavity 52, which in turn is going to boop, set the PO380 intermittently. Because you're going to clear the code, and in this case it may not come back until later because, again, it's intermittently cutting out that relay. So what nobody understands is that, or some of us don't understand, is the fact that can a relay intermittently be opening because not because of the contacts might necessarily be bad. It could be that there is an adequate voltage going to the coil side of that relay. So therefore, that's why you're supposed to do a voltage drop test about it. So again, battery voltage is 13.2, let's say, which you should have at those contacts ideally around 13.2. So therefore, that's what you're going to look at. So that's a very common issue we see with glow plug relays. Now, I'll take it a step further. If you ever worked on older TDIs, the older TDIs on those Volkswagen models, you know, those can be a pain in the butt when it comes to glow plug issues. Well, it turns out that if you had done a voltage drop from the glow plug to the ground, you will find that you had a high voltage drop. In other words, once again, voltage might be 13.5 now, right? What are you supposed to do across the glow plug? Well, from the connector to ground, right? You're going to find out you got maybe 12.1, 11.10 point, whatever volts. Well, it turns out the very common on TDI is bad grounding to the head. So we literally have attached a dual eyelid battery cable between the head and to the negative post of the battery to actually resolve that issue on poor grounding. So therefore, again, don't be afraid on these TDIs to go ahead and do a voltage drop test again between the connector going to the glow plug and the actual head where it's actually bolted to. You can have a poor grounding of that cylinder head also as well. So there you go. What do you think? Hopefully any comments are welcome. Unless there are going to be nice comments there. So so let's go back to the 7.3 though. Okay. So we saw the 7.3 here. So in this case, we see that, you know, the PCM power relay. Look how much is affected by that PCM power relay. So therefore, there is our battery junction block. The contacts close, and then we got a splice 123 right there, and it goes to all different stuff there. You'll notice it also feeds the glow plug relay to the manifold intake air relay. I mean, it goes with a whole bunch of other stuff, including the transmission. Okay, so therefore, we got a lot going on. That's why when we've had some drastic weird problems on a 7.3, my first go-to guy now from experience is to go after that PCM power relay, and I'll just swap it. But then again, I got a few of them sitting in my toolbox that I actually use for test purposes. I could do voltage drop tests. I could do all that. But a quickie is let's just swap. Let's see what's going on there. So in this case, yeah, definitely want to understand the importance of the PCM power relay. Now, another thing of why we need to have basic electrical, I'm not going to go into this, but is your diodes. Do we understand how a diode works? Now it is because this is a safety device here. So therefore, it's forward bias through here as we're going through the coil side. So it prevents any again shorts the back feed up to the pcm excuse me up to the junction block cause a direct short but again we need to understand what a diode is i'm not going to get into that because that's a more advanced but in this case we need to understand how that works and by the way i forgot to mention on that pcm power you'll notice it also controls power to who the ipr so if there is low voltage because high resistance fault on the contacts will that affect your ipr operation too as well there you go so therefore quit being cheap if you want to update that customer's old 7.3, you may want to start looking at those PCM relays and IDM and replace them because I kind of make it a habit now 
if these relays are really old, I'll just tell the customer, you know what, we're going to put new relays. We don't want to have any future electrical problems. That relay is over 20 years old, you know? So therefore, let's go ahead and replace it because we could have issues with it as we go along. But then, you know, we got the coil side of the relay. We just talked about that on that LB7. And here you can see we have, again, our battery power going here, and we can see our coil side. And I told you, once again, we could do a voltage drop test across it. And here you'll notice how beautifully these older diagrams were. It even tells you what your voltage there and your terminals that are on the relay itself. So in this case, we can see that as well. But we have to understand how it works. You'll notice, again, we have power, in other words, positive potential coming in here to the coil. Who's grounding it? The PCM. So therefore, we see that. Okay, so we have to understand and read those as we see fit. So therefore, I understand that as we look at the IDM, you know, we got power coming from the relay, but we can have intermittent issues in the wiring. And there's your, some of you might recognize this connector, which is again on the side of the valve cover there, excuse me, the PCM, not the PCM, what am I saying? The uh, the IDM. So in this case, we have to understand what each terminal is. So you guys have connector end views and you also have the wiring diagrams of how everything is actually plumbed there. But you'll notice here, we're only looking between the PCM and the IDM itself. You'll notice they share the common ground. So that makes diagnosis a little bit easier to see if we have a bad ground because it'll affect both the PCM and the IDM, as you can see there. So that's all shared by G101. So hopefully as I'm talking about this, you will notice again, there's some common things that you need to evaluate as you're testing these circuits and understand how it works. So you're covering a lot of years, by the way, when you're looking at these diagrams to understand many seven threes, you know, from all the way from 2003 back, right? So therefore again, G101, and again, that is the common ground between the IDM and the PCM so as well. So, all right. So in this case, we look at a fuel pump relay. You know, and when I talk about, you know, the fuel pump relays, I still get some technicians that are new to the field and they don't know about the inertia switches. As you can see here from seven threes to six O's to six fours to even the six sevens, have we been still using the inertia switch? Some of you may or may not know what inertia switch is, but it's actually there to shut off the actual power to the actual pump itself. So there's your lift pump right there. And in this case, that is controlled by inertia switch. The inertia switch is a switch that actually is designed for sudden movement, shall we say, if that truck gets, uh, it actually rear ends somebody. It could be triggered, but it can intermittently be triggered, but it can cause intermittent problems. So therefore here we can see that we have an inertia switch. Now, in this case, you're gonna see that after the inertia switch, you're gonna see that there's a monitor circuit right there at cavity 40 on the PCM. So ever since 7.3s on these later models, they've been using some kind of fuel pump monitor. So therefore it'll trigger a code. So when I get trucks, I just did one not too long ago where the truck had a code for again, low voltage going to the, the actual lift pump. And I said, well, how does the computer know there was low voltage? Well, there you could see the wire spliced in there monitoring that voltage there going to the lift pump itself. So in this case, who could be the culprit? It could be the relay causing high resistance. It could be the inertia switch. But in this case, my job is to start using meters or start swapping out relays to see if that's the problem. So therefore that will definitely cause issues. And always remember, if there is high resistance, like we teach in electrical, you know, if there is high resistance in a circuit, that means the amperage is gonna be lower in the circuit, right? So in this case, what that means is that there's low amperage going to the circuit, that pump may start to turn slower. And since it's turned slower, what happens to pressure and volume? It'll be affected. So that's why it's an ideal thing that if you are replacing the lift pump, you better ask yourself what could have taken out the pump prematurely. And nobody tends to want to pay attention to the fact that, hey, I need to do a voltage drop test across the motor itself because I don't want the new motor to actually fry. Now, you're probably saying, well, how would the new motor be fried? Well, if you understand how a, a motor draws current, the Watts formula comes into play. And that was volts, watts formula means volts times amps. So in this case, it's going to draw so many watts of power. But in this case, if the voltage drops, the amperage goes up. And if you know amperage, amperage creates more heat, which can shorten the life of the pump. So another thing of why we want to learn wattage formula, electrical formulas when we teach electrical. Can you take the hint that I'm actually talking about uh, maybe get some electrical training there? 
But anyways, we're look, continuing to looking at this diagram. Once again, the fuel pump relay itself, again, is providing power to many different components, as we said right here. So there you go. So as we move along, you know, we hear we we talked about a 6.4 in previous presentations. I thought I'd review that. But there's your relay. Once again, there's your fuse. Again, there's your coil contacts. Con, excuse me, your contacts right there. And then there is your coil side here. So in this case, there's that inertia switch once again. So some repetition right there. And there's that fuel pump monitor we've been talking about. And there's your pump itself as well. So obviously there's the ground. So if we do have pump problems, it is a good idea to do a voltage drop across that pump motor if possible. But remember, he's monitoring the positive potential side. Here's your fuel pump monitor right here. But in this case, does it necessarily tell you you have a good ground? No. So again, definitely want to check that because these trucks are going to age. Their cabs have been off. Fuel pump's been off. So therefore, the likelihood of getting a high resistance fault on the ground side is very, you know, pretty possible, you know. So there's your initial switch. Those who have never looked at one, it does have a reset switch right there. So on the side of it, you can push on it. It does have a reset, usually located on most trucks. On the passenger side towards the kick panel, there'll be an access panel there to actually look at those inertial switches. So as we look at a 6.0 right here, you know, it's funny because we were talking about relays and I had a guy on my YouTube channel say that he has a truck that doesn't turn off. So I literally shot a quick video about this, about the truck does not turn off. So in this case, there's my ignition switch right here. And when I follow the ignition switch, I'm going to notice that this ignition switch goes to A, B, and E. There's a continuation, but it tells you right here in the diagram that A continues on this page. So there's A up here, right? And there it goes to the coil side of this relay, which is grounded at G100, right? So there's that coil side of that relay again, and you're going to see that it's got hot at all times, a relay. There's your PCM power relay, which closes and provides power to the PCM. So this box right here represents the PCM. Now, his problem, once again, was the truck does not turn off. So obviously, he's back feeding through somewhere, but we have to isolate where it's at. So in this case, I told him, okay, here's your ignition switch right here. Obviously, A is the important one. So what I need you to do is when you turn the key off, I want you to get to this relay and probe into this relay and tell me if you still got power here. So if there is still power there, then we know that from the back side of this relay back up, we act through the ignition switch. That's where our short is at. In other words, is my is my short to power that's keeping this running before the relay or after the relay on the control side of the relay? So this is the control side of the relay, which is the coil, which controls this switch. That in turn connects power to the computer itself, right? So that's what I needed to know. Is the problem from the coil on or is it behind the relay? behind the ignition switch. So obviously, if I still have power, he turns the switch off, and we physically have power right here at cavity 86, which I'm not supposed to have, then I know, okay, my problem is on this A circuit all the way back up to the ignition switch. Something's back feeding or at the ignition switch itself or before that. But I'm trying to isolate it as before, because you know what else it can be? It could be that these relay contacts are stuck shut. You know, so in this case, they can get stuck shut. We've seen them do that in the past. So therefore, if there is no power up in 86, and I'm like, whoa, perhaps we got a stuck closed relay right there, right? So in this case, yes, I can go ahead and probe at fuse since I don't want to disconnect stuff. I'll probe at fuse 2.22. And what I'm going to do is see if I still have power there. And that tells me that the relay contacts are what? Are closed to as well. As a matter of fact, if I want to do a quick short test, let me redo this again. I could just go to fuse 2.22 and see if the switch is off, if there is power at, at that fuse 2.22 as well. But again, understanding how the circuit works is your power. And the, what I like to do is I like to use a wiring diagram, which I hope some of you like to do too as well. So that works very well. So in this case, that's what we're looking at there going towards the computer itself. So there you go. So when we look at a six liter right here, you're going to notice, you know, on my six liter right here, I decided to do some recordings. I've been doing a lot of scope recordings, which I'll show some of you today. But in this case, you know, I've been teaching about how six O's because I've been getting a lot of six O requests. Uh, we'll notice the middle connector. That middle connector is the engine connector. And then we got our body connector and our transmission connector. So here's our body connector and there is our right, you know, our, our um, engine connector. So. I'm trying to think ahead, sorry. Okay, once again, 
body, engine, and transmission. That's what you're going to see there. And you'll notice that I took the pass the driver's side battery out. I'm still using the passenger side battery. So I just wrapped the rag on so I don't short against anything and you know create a little spark snow. But it's still there. So therefore we see it. So as I talk about diagnosis, you know, I've always said when a computer is acting stupid, it's because something's making it act stupid. And to me, when you get a something that doesn't make sense or you got an intermittence it all comes down to first, let's knock out the power and grounds right off the bat. Now, I know on a six liter that there are three grounds and there are three powers at the body connector. So you'll notice here's the body connector. Now, for those of you that haven't worked on six L's, let me explain. The 46 pin connector is the same. These two are exactly the same between the body and the PC. Uh, Tony, what's wrong with you? Your engine connector and your body connector are both 46 pin, but here we're looking at the 46 pin, what? Body connector. You'll notice there's pin 40, 46. We see keep alive power pin 40 right there, right? So there's two of them. I, I didn't have space to show everything, but in this case, I will know which is power and which is ground. So again, pin 46 is way over here on the corner right there, right? So therefore I can count back and I could see where keep alive power is at pin 40. So there's 35, 36, 37, 38, 39, right? And all that. And I could even look at the color wires feeding to it, right? So therefore, there you can see the connector itself right there. So in this case, we'll see that. Let me get rid of this a little second here. And in this case, we can see right there that we see the 46 pin connector. And that's a pretty good shot. That's the engine connector we have removed right there. So, and by the way, when you remove these connectors, will you please be gentle with them? Definitely want to be gentle as you take them. So you want to probe. But guess what? I'm not probing from the front most of the time. I'm actually probing from the back because I like to do voltage drop testing a lot. So here you can see that I'm going ahead and showing the connector being removed. And in this case, what we're going to do is we're going to probe 46 right here. But again, there's all the, I took the cover off. And you're going to have to be gentle. I like to use a pick to actually move the wires out of the way. And what I like to do at that point is that I'll go ahead and do a voltage drop. So here I'm doing a voltage test here. And I'm back probing here. So there you could see my lead hooked up on that pit 46. So I have these back fed. So therefore, I will connect it up to the computer. Because right now, I am only doing an open circuit test. But in order to do it properly, I would want to plug it in. Now, I removed the probe just to show you how it's actually done there. So, therefore, it makes it a lot easier. So, once again, uh, you want to get good and make your own. If you haven't done it yet, I would hope that most of you have it. But I would like you to go ahead and measure, again, back probing, as you can see right there. So, I'm just literally showing you how I like to back probe gently and not hurt it at all. Because, again, you're just trying to do a voltage drop test. So, what I would have done at that point is I would have connected it and then located ground and literally do a voltage drop test on the connector itself. Let me see what's wrong. Now, obviously, I didn't have a great voltage drop test here because simple reason that I've done the relays on this truck in the past. So therefore, it works very well. So therefore, it does work. So here's what I want to show. When I do electrical classes, I want you to pay attention to something. Now, this circuit is on on our electrical training boards, okay? Now, on my electrical training board, you're going to see that I... I will actually do a voltage drop test across the bulb right here. And I got the leads hooked up. You'll notice here's my other banana going to the meter. So here's the meter over there. Now the bulb is not working, okay? The bulb is not working, but yet take a look right here. You know, we're gonna look at power. And in this case, I'm gonna go ahead and show you, okay, the leads, I'm gonna take the leads off. In other words, it's like if I take a connector off a component, like let's say a bulb, right? So I took the leads off, it's still assembled, but I got what? How many volts? I got 14.28. Now, this is simulating that I'm disconnecting the connector and I'm measuring voltage at that connector with it disconnected. Okay, so what's the voltage I got going to? Did you pay attention there? So therefore, there you can see the leads are being removed right there. Let me backtrack. And in this case, you're going to notice once again, my leads are off. In other words, my connector's off and I'm showing that 14.28. But was that bulb turned on? Now, let's go ahead and do a voltage drop test with the circuit Circuit still on, right? I'm reconnecting it all back to, this, to the actual component, which in this case, the bulb, and what happens to voltage. So there's the reason why the bulb does not illuminate, because I have a voltage drop of 0.297. This is a 12-volt bulb. I'm supposed to have 14 volts, but when I disconnected it, to, in other words, I disconnected, I measure voltage, I see 14. But when it's connected, what did we see? 
0.27. So one more time, playing it again. Again, the leads are on, the bulb is not on, right? I disconnect the leads and I notice again that the voltage applied to that connector to those leads is 14 point what again? 28. But the minute that I connect it, all right, I'm putting it all back on. Take a look at that. Hopefully the video is streaming good for you. And I'm putting it back on. What happens to the voltage? See that? So what we're trying to teach you here is what's the best way to test power to a component is with it on. And you want to actually have it connected. This is what we call a dynamic test, meaning that we're actually testing, right? We're back probing on the connector. That's why on the previous slide, I was showing you that you want to go ahead and back probe and test power to a computer with it on. Now, obviously, I showed this connect just to show you how the leads go. But in this case, I back probed right there, right? And I'm going to back probe the ground too. I didn't connect that yet. But in this case, I back probe to the ground and I'm literally doing a voltage drop test with it connected to the computer and the key is on. So you want to see what the real voltage is while that computer is operating. Everybody understand? I hope you all understand that. That's a classic thing that it's important to understand. That's why we teach you voltage drop testing because of the fact that you want to test components when they're connected and the circuit is on to see if it is not dropping any voltage and there's resistance in there. Because guys will call me, well, I tested power at all the leads going to this module. You're right, but did you do it with it disconnected or connected and you back probed? See what I'm saying? So that's the good, that's a good experienced technician versus a novice technician, what you want to do here. So as we look at this uh, six liter and we see the fuel pump relay right there, we're going to notice once again, that there's that inertia switch once again, and then there is your fuel pump monitor. And you know what's funny here on this cavity 19? It doesn't show in a wire and diagram what this represents. So on cavity 19, that's your fuel pump monitor. Then it continues to H. And then I say, okay, where's the continuation of H? Well, there's H over here. So in this case, you'll see H continue. Let me get my probe here. And in this case, you're going to notice H continues right over here from over here. And in this case, it goes to the lift pump there too as well. So same design, same relay action, same issues that can happen, the inertia switch like we talked about already. So again, you have to understand how the circuit works. Obviously, I've been sticking with Ford. Now, let's see the reality of it. Yes, I understand there is your relay right there. And you know, right off the bat, I can tell you which is the low side and the high side on this style relay. This is a four-prong relay. Look at the thickness of the blade versus this blade. So obviously this carries high current, this carries the low current. Well, this is the Fickham relay, okay? This is the Fickham relay on a six liter, which by the way, I, should, I feel that in policy, anytime you do a Fickham, you should do the Fickham relay. But what's beautiful, if you know how to use your scan tool and view scan data, he will tell you the Fickham voltage and he'll tell you battery voltage. So if, if there is high resistance fault in those contacts of the relay, you're gonna see a lower voltage on your scan tool, believe it or not. So I can diagnose a Fickham relay somewhat pretty good by looking at the Fickham voltage. So therefore, when I put all my data on a six liter, I look, like to look at Fickham voltage. And I also like to look at what? I like to look at battery voltage and compare those two. So if battery voltage is 13.8 and I see Fickham voltage is 12.5, that, that's a red flag right off the bat. Who could be the culprit? This guy right here. Now, when we look at our Fickham relay here on the six liter, once again, sticking to relays here, you're going to see the high current side, which is a switch side, and there's our low current side. Again, we got battery power, and the grounding takes place by this box right here, which is the, wow. So who turns on and off the Fickham relay? And I got to tell you, I kind of got, you know, a little rusty. I thought it was always the PCM for some odd reason in my head. No, the Fickham relay is controlled by whom? The Fickham module. Okay, so there is a separate wire that goes to the Fickham relay. There you can see that. So in this case, the Fickham is grounding to turn itself on. Hey, interesting. So therefore, we can actually still do a voltage drop test across the relay coil contacts to see if we got an intermittent problem because what's going to happen if this Fickham contacts are intermittently open? It's going to shut down a truck or the truck's going to want to want to shut down and it might have Fickham voltage codes, right? So in this case, it could be the relay itself. That's why you ask yourself, if this relay is drawing current, again, if the voltage is low, it's going to draw more current and in turn can intermittently fry up that Fickham. 
So therefore, if you have inner premature failure of the fecum, maybe it's a good idea to observe what your fecum voltage is, right? So in this case, we definitely want to see that. So obviously, you'll notice we have multiple cavity 25, cavity 24, cavity 4, cavity 23. We have all these voltages going to the capacitor. Obviously, they go to the capacitors going to the FICM itself. But in this case, we also have a separate uh, power coming into pin 8. And then we have another one routed through E, and we would have to locate where E goes through, which I'm not going to do at this point. So in this case, we see that happening too as well. So again, a lot going on to that FICM. So if you're diagnosing inter or premature failures with a FICM, because you don't want to just slap another FICM on. Again, our policy is to replace the relay. But at the same time, you kind of ask yourself, you know, what took out the FICM? It could have been the relay because of high resistance fault. You could have diagnosed that on the scan tool too as well. So definitely can do that. Now, let's not forget, we tend to focus on this side, the high side of the circuit, but we also need to look at the low side of the circuit. So in this case, we definitely could have grounds. And look at all the grounds you have, too. One, two, three, four, five going towards the pickle. So in this case, we definitely want to look at that because the nice thing about it is they're all located at the same ground location, which is G101. Okay, that's what we're looking at. And by the way, you'll notice these hyperlinks right here, these they're all in blue, purplish blue. And in this case, that is going to be a link to tell you where it's located at. Ford does that if you have the genuine service information there from Ford there. It makes it easy. So, so there you go. Okay. Now, later on in future classes, we're going to talk about your crank and camshaft. That's, this is your FICM sync stuff right here. So there's your crank output and your cam output too as well. These are the wires to tell the FICM that you got RPM going on because he needs to know when to fire off those injectors. So definitely want to see that happening right there. So there's your CKP and CMO. So my goal is, you know, when I look at a newer truck, you know, I'm working on early trucks right now because we have to have a good foundation. And in this case, I'm going to start off with the early stuff and learn the later stuff. In this case, I'm doing a lot of Fords and some of you guys do a lot of Fords. And in this case, you want to look at those wiring diagrams, get more acclimated with wiring diagrams, you know, see what's going on there. So, you know, as a matter of fact, a few days ago, I did a late night uh, session with a shop for about an hour talking about wiring diagrams. And, you know, we actually talked about it online. And they were more receptive, understanding how these wiring diagrams work, because that's a big challenge there in itself there. So got to learn how they work. So there you go. Now, when you look at the relay itself, some relays are pretty awesome. Sticking to that same FICM relay, there you can see that there is the contacts right there. So in this case, we see one, five, two, and three, right? You could read the diagram itself. There's the contacts right here. So you're going to try to figure out, well, there's three. And then when the contacts close, that goes to five. So three and five are the contact side, while the coil side, which is this guy right here, is one and two. So the low current and the high current side. And like I told you already, you'll see the difference in the thickness. So What's nice about most relays, not all, most relays will show you a diagram, you know. So you'll see 87 and 30, for example. That's the high current side on some GM relays that we see traditionally. And here you can see the FICM relay that Ford uses on the FICM itself, right? There's five and six uh, um, prong relays that can exist too as well. So therefore you can have more. But when you're looking at relay itself, right, you can also test the coil side because the coil can be shorting, right? So in this case, we can take known relays and know what the resistance is. So in this case, you know, here you could see that I'm actually measuring the resistance right here. Let me get rid of this again. And in this case, we can see what the resistance here. So therefore, I, you know, will like to probe because they could be shorted, right? So if it is shorted, relay coils can be shorted. So therefore, they are making contact there. I'm trying to do it one hand and hold the camera at the same time. But in this case, there you could see the resistance is roughly, what, 70 ohms. I'm trying to keep my hand steady there. But in this case, you know, we're measuring about 70 ohms right there. Now, if you don't know what the resistance value is, the service manuals don't give us a resistance factor. We can take a known good relay, right? And guys, it's not expensive to buy a new relay. And in this case, that's why I keep a relay in stock. Also as a reference, but also as a quick test to see if that's what my issue is. But in this case, you definitely want to test it that way. So again, don't forget about testing the coil side of a relay because they can be shorted. And if they're shorted, they will draw more amperage and cause intermittent issues too as well. And that's what we see there. All right. Test those coil sides of those relays. Very important to do. Now, there is the socket right there for the relay itself. Now, obviously, we need to check signals sometimes. So therefore, if I want to see... If I am getting a signal, 
you know, you can turn the key on and say, okay, T, is it energizing the relay? Am I getting a signal? But hold on, let me backtrack to the wiring diagram here. Let's go back to this guy right here. There's the FICOM relay. We found out already that the FICOM is the one that's actually energizing the relay. So therefore, at pin two or, or at terminal two of the relay right there, right? That's the signal wire. But you will notice though, this is a grounding circuit. It's what we call a pull down circuit. This is a grounding circuit. So if I wanna make sure that the FICOM is energizing that relay, I can quickly check for a signal, not necessarily a voltage drop test, but we can do a signal test. And in this case, that's what I'm doing at cavity two. So, but you got to understand, what are you looking for? Power? Uh -uh. This is why I don't like you using power probes because you might probe the wrong piece. If you put power right here at cavity two, you just created a short right there and it might fry the thickum, right? So in this case, no power probes unless you're using that power probe that now has the multimeter function and all that. But the early ones, no, I, I hate power probes. But anyways, you'll notice it's a pull down circuit. So therefore, if you probe at terminal two, you have what? Grounding taking place. So you turn on the switch, you should see a signal come in there just to make sure we don't have an open or some type of connector issue at the FICM. Because if you worked on FICMs on these six liters, you all know about how lovely those connect connectors can be broken, especially those that come in with Oh, they got uh, those some kind of tie downs, tying it down, zip ties all around it because somebody broke the lock on the connector, right? So that's very common. So therefore, as I'm moving along here, yeah, we can probe that signal. So the, obviously my meter is connected to positive, right? Because I'm looking for a ground signal going there and that's what I'm checking there. So therefore, you know, I took a video of this so you can check the signal there, what's going on there. So obviously I'm using the right small one. You don't want to damage it. You want to be easy with it because if you're using a fat terminal, right, you're going to actually get, you're going to open that terminal and you don't want to open that terminal to cause poor contact. So there you can see, again, I'm probing there and I do have battery voltage there as well. So therefore that's what I'm testing there. So one side ground on the other side, battery voltage. So that's open circuit testing that you're doing there. Okay. Just open circuit testing. Now, ideally, what you want to do is when you're testing this is you also want to do a voltage drop test in terms of, uh, let's see, where do I have this one here? Now, obviously, I'm measuring voltage there. Let me mute the sound here. But in this case, you'll notice how I probed on the side there. <clears throat> you can get creative on how you want to probe. So I have a skinny probe and I'm measuring my battery voltage there. So therefore, that's how you can do voltage drop. I could stick one on the other side going into an angle and I could literally do a voltage drop test on the relay too. So that's how I physically do them for those of you that were wondering how we actually do that. So definitely easy. <clears throat> so therefore, you know, you do want to use all these different type of adapters that are out there. But if you want to do it this way, this is another way. I do have those attachments. I didn't bring them in here in my office, but I actually have those attachments that go on top of the relay. And therefore, at that point, I can probe each one and do voltage drop test out there. So therefore, you can do that as well. So that's one way of doing it. So Make sense? Any questions? Learning? Doing good? How am I on time here? Almost the hour up, but we're doing good. So in this case, again, understanding how to test these circuits is very important. But also, you'll notice that I try to cover also at the same time on those wiring diagrams, understanding how they work. So I bet you how many of you knew that... Uh, that the computer controls, the FICM controls that FICM relay. You know, pretty interesting how that works. So, all right. Very good, very good. So that's what we're diagnosing there. All righty, enough of that. As we move along here, hopefully these uh, videos and images help you out. All right, a while back, we've been talking about lab scope. Now, this is not a lab scope class, but I just throw a bone right here about lab scopes. We got to get into the use of of lab scopes, right? Now, and I'm not gonna lie to you, um, it's been, if I've used my lab scope three to four times in the last year is a miracle, but we've had those intermittent drivability problems. We've had issues with injectors because we've been talking about it with other webinars that we've done about lab scopes. So, and the best way, you know, my friend Jim Wilson, who's on here on this class, he can tell you, he's done a presentation for us in the past talking about lab scopes and lab scope to me, is a visual way to see what's going on with electricity in motion. So therefore you wanna see what's happening with that. In this case, you gotta understand, you know, for the most part, lab scopes measure voltage and time. So what you need to do, if you wanna get acclimated with voltage, there's many presentations out there. Hell, there's many freebies on YouTube that you can read or watch on use of digital storage oscilloscope or DSOs. <coughs> 
excuse me, is showing you what's going on there with, um, you know, with, with, with the electrical circuit. So, you know, but probably the most useful tool that we use also to be voltage signals to look at amperage, you know. For example, if you got a lip pump running, and now that we got three phase pumps being used like Duramax, you know, L5Ps and so on, you know, scopes can become a handy tool. Sometimes the problem is getting to the components themselves, right, to do some tests. So you might be spending some time, but sometimes it's easy to put a clamp around the wire to see what the current draw on is. A good example, once again, is the lip pump, right? So you're going to see people talk about, uh, what do they call it? Um, oh, my God, I just drew it blank. In other words, they're doing some type of relative compression test. And in this case, they're looking at the starter draw. So if each piston is actually has the same compression, the amperage draw should fluctuate the same amount as each one reaches top dead center in the fire order of that engine. But if one's weaker, then you know you got a weak cylinder. So, But if you pretty good, I like to think my ear's gotten pretty good because of the fact that I can see, or excuse me, not see, I can hear the change in RPM speed. So with that said, sorry, scratch on the throat there. So with that said, you can do a lot with a lab scope. And now with pressure transducers, we're going to do a, a presentation of that in the future too, about pressure. Trans That's pretty cool. But in this case, I'm old school. I still believe in the compression gauge. But if I want to know for sure if I got a weak cylinder because I got low compression, that's a quick telltale what's going on. But I've learned my lessons. Because earlier you heard me mention about valve lash on a Duramax application. We have seen weak cylinders from excessive valve lash. You hear the clack, 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 and guys think that's an injector. A novice will think it's an injector, and it's not. It just means that 5967 Cummins, Duramax, all the way from LB7 till now, require a valve lash adjustment. That can throw the compression big time off, and not to mention your fuel adjustment, your fuel trimming, your balancing rates can be off because of excessive valve lash adjustment. But scopes can actually tell you a whole heck of a through an electrical signal, what's going on. So therefore, you know, one thing you may want to take interest in is there's very, you know, there's many different companies that sell you lab scopes. You don't have to buy a high dollar one. You can buy a low dollar one. And in this case, you know, if you go to our website of Powertrain Training, you know, you can see Jim's presentation there. And in this case, you know, we talk about using an inductive clamp to see what's going on with it. But, but basically it starts off with you understanding what you're looking at. You know, you're looking at voltage and time, like I said. So therefore, you want to see what's going on with the circuit. So when do I like to use a lab scope? For me, lab scope is when I got an intermittent problem. I've done my basics, and that's something you got to keep in mind is before I even deal with anything, I'm going to look at my power and grounds going to the different modules. For example, transmission control versus PCM control, ECM, TCM, whatever. Let's check powers and grounds before I start getting crazy. I'm trying to figure out what's the intermittent problem. And the one that sucks when it comes to intermittent problem is the one that has no code set. There's no direction of where this problem can be at. And some of us have gotten smart. Because when we have an intermittent problem, you know, we say, okay, it's chugging along. That means it's starving for fuel. So it's fuel related. If all of a sudden it dies, it means a power problem or a loss of a crank or cam signal, right? So therefore we look at that. So we can analyze our scan data, see if something shoots out, right? I know some of you guys gotten really good at this and that's great. But in this case, it could be other things too as well. That's where lab scope comes in, right? So therefore, you know, we, we have to know the signals that we're looking at, right? So in this case, there are basically two types of signals that we're going to see for the most part, and that is AC and DC. And as we talk about EV, that whole thing is just, we, the voltages have gone through the roof here because we are dealing with high voltage AC, and we also see something called a DC to DC converter. You know, what's a DC to DC converter? Well, we're going from DC this voltage to DC this voltage, right? And in this case, we have to understand what's going on. So another reason why to know electrical. So in this case, we have DC, direct current, right? And most of our signal circuits from most of our sensors, for the most part, have been zero to five volt, right? Now, if you look at a Duramax, sticking to Duramax, that is a 10 volt signal on the early models, right? For those of you that didn't know, is it 10 volt, 12 volt? Oh, crap, I forgot. I think it's 12 volt. But in this case, we got AC signals. Now, we just talked about a six liter. And we could see here that the six liter has a cam sensor that's a variable reluctance sensor along with a crank sensor that's a very reluctant sensor. So we have to understand how they actually view. So as much as I want you to learn lab scopes, if you don't know what an analog DC signal is versus a digital DC signal is, then we're not going to understand a lab scope, right? 
So in this case, we have to know what we're looking at. You know, is it AC or DC? That's why in the service publications, they've been showing you, they tell you about how these sensors work. Now, I'm kind of spoiled with my Snap-on Zeus. Not that I'm advertising for Snap-on, but it's the tool that I actually use. And a lot of guys that are out there on the trade, we tend to use the, either the Veris or the Zeus. And here you can see me. Actually, I think I'm going into a six liter two on this one. And it's all nice for those of you who've never seen this. You know, it's what's out there. And this is not the only tool that offers this. There's other tools out there that help, help you diagnose electrical problems. And there's my sensors right there. And you'll notice right off the bat, I think I picked a cam sensor there. And in this case, you know, when I pick the cam sensor, you're going to get component information. So like I've said before, it's showing you both digital, which is a Hall Effect style sensor. And then you got your variable reluctance inductive pickup type of sensor. So there's different names for the same thing. It's showing me the connector and where to probe. Well, I could do it there, but it's easier for me to go to the computer and probe that signal. So earlier we showed you the body and the engine connector. I can go ahead and probe these signals at the actual where, at the actual connector on the computer. So instead of me playing, you know, trying to get under there to try to get to that signal, it is easier for me to do it at the computer. That's why I tell people, if you're really good with a scope and you want to do a thorough test of all the signals, you can get a connector in view identification. And what you can do at that point is start highlighting all the signal circuits and know what each signal circuit should be. Now, service manuals do give you that. Okay, they tell you what signals are, typical signals, they call it, typical scan data. And with a scope, you can actually look at the signal, look at the quality of the signal, and also at the same time, measure the frequency of the circuit, the peak voltage, whatever it is that you're looking at. That's why you need to know how they work and what kind of signals they generate, and that'll make you pretty smart. So I find myself doing that more with trucks that have intermittent problems where I'm actually scoping. Now, I'm not going to lie to you. When I look at a, for example, cam and crank signal, and I see an interruption in the cam and crank signal and the vehicle misses, I need to ask myself, is the problem the cam and crank sensor, I see it where it's intermittently cutting out, or is it a result of the misfire? You know, so therefore, you know, you got to know what you're looking at in order to understand what's happening there. So therefore, you know, it requires a little more and more experience. So therefore, Look what it even tells you at the end. That's why I like this information there. As you look at the tech note there on the lower left, it says some vehicle equipped for variable cam time will use two cam sensors, one for each bank. That would be like a gasoline with the variable <coughs> camshaft timing. But if sensors improperly installed or indexed can identify the cylinder as one and may produce a tip and hesitation may generate a PO 340, which we have seen on a six liter because on a six liter, it isn't the sensor. It's actually the reluctor wheel. So that reluctor wheel could be moving. So here's the sensor pointing directly to get a trigger from that reluctor wheel. But in this case, if it's got excessive thrust play on the crank, especially those trucks that have manual transmissions, it's going to actually vary the signal. It could lose the signal to the point it could actually hesitate to install and cause that PL340 to set. So that's what you could see there. So in this case, what I'm trying to jump into is, you know, we can use a lab scope, and here you can see a scope I did of the actual cam sensor. And in this case, we can see the number one open signal right there that you can see intermittently opening right there. Okay, let me pause this, see if we can catch it right there. There's your intermittent pause that you're looking at there. So when we look at an AC signal, we can see the voltages right here, and we can look at various different things. So when we look at an AC signal, there's going to be an average voltage. We, there is what we call RMS voltage, which stands for root mean squared. There is peak voltage and there's peak to peak voltage. Because if I were to ask you in a quiz, okay, you're analyzing an AC signal, such as an older style vehicle speed sensor or a camera crank sensor, as you can see right here, a cam sensor, you know, you need to look at this. Because let me tell you, as I give this truck RPM, that amplitude or that voltage is going to go high and low. So we need to understand what it's doing. So if I have a truck that's actually running rough, not running great, and I could see that as I accelerate, it barely even goes up or down, most likely I can have an issue with the actual cam sensor itself. So therefore, you can analyze it. Now, as I'm working on this truck, please note something, though. You know, I'm actually taking, you know, a reading on a known good truck. There's no issues with this truck. But yet, I was a little bit apprehensive because I would have a hands But, you know, if I see too much fluctuation, in the peak-to-peak -peak voltage right here, 
I'm like, okay, do I see a lot? No, it's pretty much. So I tested another six liter and just to make sure. So in other words, like Jim Wilson even says that before you start testing on trucks, test on a known good truck and come up with your values. Because let's face it, the industry does not give us specs on these sensors many often. I mean, Snap-on does this give me an average RMS voltage, but it doesn't tell me what the peak voltage is and what it should be on an average truck. So therefore, if I'm checking a truck at idle and I'm checking another truck at idle, I should have similar voltages. In other words, almost the same voltages from peak to peak as you're testing these. So therefore, after playing with six liters, six fours, and now that I'm playing with six sevens now, you know, we're taking good known and recording. So that's what's nice about these scopes is that I could take those recordings and save them for future reference. So that actually will tell me, do I have a good sensor, or bad sensor? Because some of you have called me in the past and actually put a new sensor on it. And still the truck has a different problem or still has a problem that you had before. And turns out that you have a bad brand new sensor. And that's a terrible thing. And it could be an OEM one, right? So in this case, that is not fun to see or fun to have. So therefore, definitely want to pay attention to that when you're diagnosing your cam and crank sensors there. So there you go. So, you know, are all sensors common in their operation? You know, yeah, they are. And I, like I've said before in previous slides, is that do you know your sensors, right? So MAP sensors, you know, we're seeing a lot of issues with L5Ps, for example, with MAP sensors because of the carbon fouling. But in this case, we can view that signal to see what it's doing there. We can look at the analog signal. And in this case, we got, you know, even your fuel pressure, your high fuel pressure sensor on your older Bosch common rails, we see some issues with that. Hell, we had one that was weird that was causing intermittent misfire. So again, the way we found it was we were looking at the signal and it actually went below zero to a negative value. Go explain that one, right? So in this case, we're like, whoa, I'm not supposed to see a negative value on this sensor. Why did I see? So therefore, we definitely had a problem internal in the sensor, which was causing a misfire there. So therefore, yeah, you can get crazy stuff like that. So we, we, you know, as trucks continue to age with after treatment, that differential pressure sensor can start to show some issues too as well. But in this case, again, we need to have a good case of no sensors. In other words, you got to know how they all work and what type of sensors they produce. I mean, I could go down the line here and I could tell you from experience, not only from teaching, but on working on trucks, what these sensors are, you know, are they pressure type sensors? You know, are they thermistors? Are they magnetic resistive sensors? Are they Hall effect? You got to know all that. So that's why, again, we push the electrical training there. Okay. We had to know how they work to become better at understanding um, how these all work. So therefore definitely want to get on the bandwagon because if you look under the service manual and you go into description operation, you might be surprised what you learned in the service manual. That's why I've said before is, when you actually do, you know, your self-study, you take time to learn. I hope you look into the description operation. You'd be surprised what you might learn and take a look at those wire diagrams that those are all set up. For example, I have a binder uh, and I don't have it here, but I have a binder for power strokes. I have a binder for Duramax and I have one for Cummins. And in this case, I already highlighted the power and grounds, the signal circuits. I already have it all preset. So therefore, instead of me logging on a computer and try to find it all, it's already preset. And there it is, right? So in this case, that makes it easier for me to um, understand and how to do some basic power and ground checks, you know. And as I talk to other industries, you know, I talk to car guys and this guy's where they turn the key on, the engine's running and everything's flashing, you know. You know, you definitely got a power distribution or some type of network problem that's making things freak out in this way, you know. So it's like, so once again, understanding how it all is laid out and how it's powered up, so. So therefore, you know, we've been talking in the past about the mass airflow sensors and so on. So let me switch back to my service information right here. Now I left off here on, um, and yes, I am a big Identifix user right here. And in this case, as I go back to my service information, if I stick to this here, we can see on engine here. And for those of you who don't know how I work stuff, this is the way I work. Hopefully you can all see my screen here. And in this case, uh, under engine controls, I've learned from General Motors through my years that when you go to diagnostic information procedures, change now with the L5P, but there's my list of codes there, right? And in this case, we know how, you know how the codes are set there. There's all your list of codes. But then as I go afterwards, I look at the symptom charts and also fuel system charts as I look at there. So in this case, there's even your IM system information, in other words, for your monitors, for those of you in California, for example, where you got to look at your monitors and how all that is set. 
And again, there's your symptom charts there that actually work pretty good. Now, there's your scan tool def and data definitions, and there's your scan tool data list. I'm going to click on that one. So as we look at the scan tool data list, there's your typical data that you're looking at, and there's those values that I was telling you. For example, here on APP sensor one, there is my typical voltage value. So I can probe that APP sensor one signal circuit, and I could see where the voltages are at if question, if you're diagnosing. You follow? And, you know, my friend, Mr. Kennedy, he posts a lot on Facebook and, uh, you know, he talks about how he diagnoses some trucks and he was even covering one on a Dodge Ram, you know, in this case, talking about the voltages. You know, I'm like, how in the hell did this tech miss this? You know, Kennedy caught it. It's like, you know, you're, you're, you you got an APP signal circuit and you know you got a problem. They put another APP and they didn't even go to the computer and probe those voltages right there. So again, 0.44 to 0.95 for AP sensor one. But his problem was APP sensor two on that model, if I remember correctly. And, you know, there's your value right there, which you should have at closed throttle. So again, you got to learn how to find that information. So it turns out that tech obviously did not know, but he didn't even follow the code charts or even understand, hey, a sensor generates a signal and that signal must go to the computer and I could probe it there at the computer itself to see if I am indeed getting that 0.44, 3.9. But hell, you don't even have to probe. You can actually connect the scan tool and read it off the data screen right off the bat, you know, if you want to start from there. So in this case, that's what you're looking at. So in this case, please note, you have to, and I'm just giving you an example of an early model here, but the later models have their signals too as well. So here you can see, all the different values here, all displayed for scan tool data. So pretty cool. So in this case, definitely want to look at. So that's why I've said before, as I, I'm even attempting to even cover this with you, is the fact that you need to understand or need to look at what the service information is giving you. you got to get fluent on this. So I've gotten, I would like to see I'm, I'm pretty fluent in my GM, my Fords, and in my um, the Dodge Ram, since those are the big three I deal with for the most part, on where they have it, how they have it. Unfortunately, there's no <coughs> there's no same thing on finding. And now, if you're good at your your pro demand, you're good at your all data, God bless you. That's good for you. I've, I work with those two as well. But in this case, definitely is. Now, last but not least, since you know, since I'm approaching the, the 15 after timeline, is when you get codes, right? The ones that I despise are, uh, let's see, oh, um, let me pick one code here, is um, is like something of a circuit code. <clears throat> now, what do I mean by that? Uh, first of all, if you're new to this, right, or you're a novice at this and you know you need help, you can do your own self-study because the code itself can be a powerful tool. I look at the new RAM service information. They, said they tend to copy a little bit about how GM does stuff like you see here. I'll tell you what I like about a RAM is on a RAM application, they actually show you the wiring diagram with the code. So if I know I have an ECT problem, IAT problem, I don't know these sensors very well, and I never learned them well, I'm going to go ahead and go to the diagnostic trouble code chart related to it, right? Here you can see something as basic as the IAT sensor, which is the inlet or temperature sensor. Which is, so those of you that don't know, you're going to learn off the bat here. The inlet or temperature sensor is a variable resistor, sometimes called a thermistor. The inlet air temperature sensor measures the temperature, obviously going into the intake. It uses 5 volt to the inlet air temperature signal circuit. In other words, I'm not going to read it all, but it tells you what's going on there. Hell, it even tells you towards the end there is that if the ECM detects an excessively low inlet air temperature signal voltage indicating a high temperature, the PO112 will set. Now, some of you are saying, Tony, this is basic stuff. I get it. You're right, but I deal with technicians that don't get it, right? And so when they get a circuit code, and they're replacing the sensor already. They're not even doing none of the diagnostic trouble tree stuff. You know, in other words, following the code chart right here. <clears throat> and they're re immediately replacing the sensor. You know, that kind of makes it a sin right there. Because, you know, it tells you to perform this diagnostic system check. Do you have other codes there, right? And it tells you to install the scan tool and turn the ignition on with the engine off. Observe the inlet air temperature sensor. Is it more, <coughs> excuse me, than 262? <clears throat> then it tells you observe any freeze frame failure records. In other words, it takes you step by step. Guys don't seem to have the damn time to follow this, right? And you're supposed to follow, you know. For example, are you reading minus 38 degrees? I know that that's an open circuit on the temperature sensor on the on a GM. So it tells you to test for opens and so on, right? I guess what I'm trying to say is 
give these circuit codes a chance, you know, try to learn something here. <clears throat> like I said before, it might take you the long way there, but it's going to get you there. But at the same time, I want you to learn. So therefore, you know, if I understand how an inlet air temperature sensor works, this right here covers so many model years of how these inlet temperature sensors work. It's a thermistor on a RAM. It's a thermistor on a Ford. It's a thermistor on a RAM. So therefore, you're learning how these all work. So when I step back and I see guys post issues they got or even phone calls that I get sometimes, I'm like, yeah, come on, you don't know how any letter temper sensor, you, yeah, I've done the sensor and I'm measuring this. And again, they have no clue about the what, the use of the meter and they don't know what they're looking at. You know, it's just like, hello. So therefore, you know, this computer has some smarts to it, you know, so you ought to be giving it a chance on what you're looking at there too as well. So therefore, definitely do that. Uh, definitely want to help yourself out in understanding how that all works. So now let me go back over here. And, and the next thing I told you to look at is obviously your schematics, right? So therefore your diagrams and how it all works, you know, in this case, <clears throat> there's my fuel pressure sensor. Let me just look at this diagram. Now this is early model diagrams. A lot of different people use these, but in this case, here's your ECM right there with your five volt references. So in this case, if I'm looking at the fuel pressure sensor, we need to learn how these diagrams work. There's connector two, you have a connector one. So this is cavity 17 of connector one, but we're working off the ECM on connector two. Connector two, connector one, connector one. So we have to understand which cavity it is. So therefore I need a connector in view to know how these are at and where they're at so I can probe and test. So if I am looking at a signal circuit, you're asking yourself, well, which is the signal circuit? Well, there's your three wires, one, two, and three, and I could read off the ECM, which is which. My cavity three is on the connector here is five volt reference. My low references, which is your ground, is actually pin one, and your signal wire is cavity 58 at connector two, so I can probe that signal. So I can, raise and lower the rail pressure and I can view it on my meter or I can view it on a scope to see that analog signal. So in this case, you can do that. So it's all a matter of you understanding what you're probing and what you're looking, not to mention the color wire. There's my yellow wire for the signal and I understand that 10 wire is my five volt reference. <clears throat> so therefore, again, that's all part of your electrical diagnosis about learning where everything is at. So in a nutshell, you got the connector, the connector and views, the wiring diagrams. And if you have a circuit code test, follow the circuit code and understand what you're looking at. Not to mention, you want to see circuits by using a lab scope. But again, before you start getting crazy with lab scopes, you got to invest time in yourself to start playing and testing with it. You got people to contact, you know, you got people you can understand. You know, I just talked to a shop not too long ago, and this guy came from the automotive market. And he says, Tony, I, I'm old scope, and I, you know, I came from an automotive. We're doing a lot of scope, and I'm showing the guys in the shop how we can save time by using a scope there, too. So, again, that's why we're going to offer more future scope training, too, as well, as I'll do some live demos on trucks as I move along here. So, definitely want to do that. So, so there you go. Um, any, I guess that's pretty much, I'm running a little early. I thought I was doing shares. So therefore, there you go. Definitely want to use the service information there. So therefore, all righty. So again, all the sensors, you can look at. We've, we've shown this mass airflow sensor. And by the way, earlier I was talking about mass airflow sensors. And I was telling you about the heater circuit. So definitely want to look at the heater circuit of the mass airflow. Because if that heater is not getting adequate voltage, that can also cause intermittent problems there so there you go how did i do mr david once again i think outstanding tony um Thank we you, can sir. tell that you're really really passionate about uh, electrical training so on that subject can you elaborate a little bit on what do you offer for electrical training in other words do you i know you probably offer on-site uh, training at some location but do you offer, say, for example, web-based training or, uh, in other words, you know, do you have some boards that you can send out? Give us just a little bit of a perspective on training. The problem with that, we're actually what, we're, what I'm working on, I think I found the answer, is when we take Teach Electrical 1, it's uh, series circuits and parallel circuits and Ohm's Law and what is electricity, a foundation, if you will, a good foundation on knowing what is electricity. And in this case, I have found out that many of your local auto parts have everything we need. So therefore, in other words, we need bulbs, we need resistors, we need switches. So we actually are, I have, 
I'm not, oh God, I don't have it here. But we actually have a little poor man setup that we're going to be marketing here starting in January. Okay. So in this case, it'll be a class where you're going to have to have a meter. We're going to ship you out these bulbs and these circuits. You're going to assemble circuits. And obviously, we're going to charge you for that. But it's not going to be as expensive with these high-tech boards because the problem has been costs. Because to, to actually send the whole big board and then hopefully get it back is the concern. So we came up with this cheaper thing. So we're hoping to have that. Why well, I'm going to have that open for January because I can't sit here and tell you about electrical if I don't offer it. And there are other people that are offering it. But this is going to be a self-study where you're going to meet with me one or two times a week for an hour, either in the evenings or in the day, whatever. And we're going to go over those electricals. So therefore, this is going to be a, uh, you know, pretty much something you can do for yourself. Sounds good. Electrical one. So we're starting with electrical one there. We're going to figure electrical two later. Electrical two is actually covering <laughs> variable resistors, transistors, diodes, the, a little bit more advanced stuff and also rectifier circuits that we're using too on our charging systems. So therefore that's coming up there mm -hmm. later in February, I'm working on, we're figuring that one out as we move along. But here in Las Vegas and in remote classes where I'm gonna be offering electrical, we do have our two day course for electrical one. And we offer our two day electrical course also for the EL2, the, the more advanced one. And in this case, that's going to be here in Las Vegas, and we're going to be offering it at remote locations coming up here in our schedule from January through April. So. Okay, sounds good. Appreciate that. Um, in the Q&A here, there's a, uh, a statement. It says, uh, if the participants are having problems testing relays, Lyle makes a couple of relay jumper kits. So he yep. encourages you to purchase them. So that's yep, a good point. <clears throat> So thank you, Robert, about that. Yeah, that does help. Yeah, it definitely is very good. So therefore, yeah. So sure. any questions thing... from anybody? Anybody have any questions? Do you feel electricals in need? Any response? Any input is greatly appreciated. Don't sit there quietly. Or asleep. Are you asleep? Are you awake? So therefore, yeah, definitely have some comments we'd like to hear from you. And those of you that are uh, watching this as a recording, please note that, um, you know, any questions, you can email me. You can let uh, these people know too as well. There's David's email too. He can forward to me. But my email is T Salas, S-A-L-E-S, T Salas, S-A-L-S, at dieseltg.com. Dieseltg.com. I didn't put it on the slide, but there you go. If not, there's David's and there's Erica's email too as well. But hopefully you learned and helped you out. Yeah, we really appreciate it, uh, Tony. A lot, a lot of good information. I was going to ask you one question. Give us an idea, a, a lab scope. You're promoting the use of lab scope and so forth. Give us a ballpark figure as to something, you know, a reasonable product, but not the top of the line, not the bottom of the line. What what does a lab uh, a lab scope cost more or less? Well, there are really inexpensive lab scopes out there being sold in the trade for as little as 400, 500 bucks for a decent good wow. one. Digital one okay to all the way to a high dollar one that could rank go up to all the way to 2000 everybody in the automotive trade could tell you the pico scope is the favorite but in this case that's laptop based um but it does it's very reliable it's been very good but there's other people that use inexpensive small scopes out there so therefore it could range but it, you know to me if you're starting out you may want to start with an expensive one and then you can move on to the more advanced stuff you know so it, you can use it and learn it so Sounds now I good. still I was I've been cleaning out my garage right now and I bent into my old Master Tech scan tool. My old Master Tech scan tool, those of you that knew the Vitronics back in the day, and that one had a scope built into it, and that still was till the day could still be used as a scope, believe it or not, because electricity electricity to scope, the difference between the new ones and uh, older ones is the speed they can capture, not to mention their ability to store as well. But in this case, um, you know. You can get an older scan scope, but, you know, just look on the various classified sections for different websites out there on the automotive side. IATN, for example, um, you can find some used ones out there, too, as well. So. Very good. And you also um, were uh, commenting about uh, the uh, multimeter. I know, say, for example, I, I looked at yours there just briefly. It looks like a Fluke 87, but it was mm -hmm. made by Kent Moore or branded Kent Moore. Yeah, this is a Kent there Moore. Go. I've oh, had mine. Fluke 87 one. So, yeah, yeah, I've had mine, I don't know, 30, 40 years, and it still works great, you know? It's a yeah. tremendous investment. But uh, on yeah. that note, just like to remind everybody, on Tuesday, December 5th, at the same time as we started this webinar today, we're going to have another webinar with uh, a few important announcements. I'd encourage you, if you haven't signed up for that particular um, 
uh, webinar to do so. If you haven't uh, received uh, a, a promo on that one and a registration, uh, please uh, uh, register for it. And uh, we look forward to seeing you next Tuesday, same time. Once again, Tony, thank you very much for a great presentation. And we look forward to one again in uh, December. Have a great rest of the day. It. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Take care.